This video will cover the performance of a factorial ANOVA, a situation in which we might be comparing three or more group scores, groups of scores, on two separate independent variables or two separate types of treatments. Now we have four assumptions that we make here uh, when we use the factorial ANOVA. The first is that uh, the outcome we're using is a single quantitative outcome. The second is that the data has already been screened for accuracy, completeness, and also for the outcome variable to be normally distributed. The third is that there is some level of randomization involved in either subject selection or subject assignment to the groups. And then the last is that the variance within the outcome variable is equivalent across all of the subject groups. So in this case, what we're going to work with data is we have, um, as an outcome, we have weight loss uh, percent, the percentage of weight loss someone has, has lost. And the two independent variables are going to be um, exercise level or the level of exercise. So they will be either exercising less than 30 minutes per day or greater than 30 minutes per day. And then we have uh, the other independent variable. So that in, so this variable or this factor of exercise level has has two levels, less than 30 minutes and greater than 30 minutes. The other independent variable or factor is diet plan, and we have three levels of this particular independent variable or factor. We have a low carb, we have a low fat, and then we have a balanced diet. So what we're going to attempt to do then is to look at the effect of exercise level by itself independently on weight loss percentage, and then also look at the effect of diet plan all by itself or independently on weight loss percentage. And then we're also going to look to see if there's some sort of a unique interaction between certain exercise levels and certain diet plans. So this would technically be what's known as a two-way ANOVA since we have two factors that we're testing. If we had a third factor, this would be considered a three-way ANOVA. So the first step then as we begin to consider how we're going to attack the analysis is to come up with null hypotheses for this particular analysis. And when we're doing a factorial ANOVA, we actually are going to have multiple hypotheses that we would need to set. And so we're going to have a hypothesis for each of the factors as far as their effect independently. And then we're also going to have a null hypothesis for the interaction of those factors. So our first null hypothesis would be that exercise level by itself will not uh, create differences in weight loss percentage among the groups. That diet plan, and then the second hypothesis would be that diet plan by itself does not create any significant differences in weight loss percentage among the groups. Then the third null hypothesis would be that there will be no interaction or no significant interaction um, among some unique combination of exercise level and diet plan. Now if we had a third factor or a fourth factor then we would have to have additional null hypotheses to address the effect of those factors independently. Now we also need to set our hypothesis decision-making criteria and we're going to continue to work with the P less than 0.05 level. So again the null hypothesis will be uh, rejected if the F score we calculate is associated with a p-value less than 0.05. And then we would then move on to do post hoc analysis to compare um, pairs of groups. If the F score we calculate is associated with a p-value greater than 0.05, then we will accept, accept the null hypothesis and we would stop at that point. We wouldn't need to go on to do any post hoc testing. At that point, we would say that there is an unclear difference among the groups. So just like when we do single-factor ANOVA, we, we have to do the first step, which, which is to determine if there are differences somewhere among the groups within each of the factors. And then if we've determined that there is a difference, we need to go ahead and do a post hoc to see where the differences actually lie. Okay, once we've established that, we then can go to the Analyze menu and we're going to go to the general linear model option and again because we're still working with analysis of variance we have a single outcome and so we choose the univariate option. Okay, Our first step is to take our 
outcome variable, which in this case is weight loss percentage, and move that into the dependent variables box. And then we need to move our two factors, in this case exercise level and diet plan, and move those into the fixed factors window. Okay, our next step is to go to the post hoc uh, option button and choose that. And so this is where we're going to tell SPSS to which post hocs we wish to do. And again, we're only going to use these post hoc outcomes if we have significance of the initial ANOVA analysis or the initial F score. Uh, if we don't have significance, then the post hocs are irrelevant, but we can tell SPSS what those would be up front. So we need to move our two factors over into this box to the right, and then we need to choose our post hocs. As I mentioned, at this point we're going to assume equal variances are there among the groups on the dependent outcome, and we will actually test that assumption as we move into the outcome uh, window. But for now, we are going to uh, look at uh, using the Chaffe post hoc because we have unequal group sizes. Uh, this is a single uh, me single measured outcome. There's no repeated measures or no averaged outcome here. It's, it's a single outcome, so we can choose the Chaffe post hoc. We click continue, and then we want to go to the options menu, and this is where we get some additional information from the analysis. We first need to move all of our factors in the interaction over into the right hand box so that we can get means for all of those groups so that's something we'll be able to report descriptively. We then want to ask for additional descriptive statistics which includes variance. We want to ask for the effect size so we can determine the practical significance. We can also ask for the observed power of the analysis again determining if we have uh, good practical significance. And then lastly, we can choose the homogeneity test, which is going to allow us to test the assumption that we have equal variances on the outcome variable across our groups. Okay, and then we click Continue. And then we click OK to see our output. Okay, the first box we can look at is uh, this top box indicating how many subjects are in each group. And you can see we definitely have unequal group sizes. The next box will indicate to us our descriptive statistics for each of the groups. So for example, individuals who are on the low fat plan and exercise less than 30 minutes per day, we can see their weight loss percentage was around 9%. <clears throat> Those on the low carb plan exercising less than 30 minutes lost close to 12% and so on. So we can at least get a a snapshot picture of, of how much weight was lost in each group relative to the exercise. Okay, our next step is to measure or determine if we've met that assumption of equal variances among our groups on the outcome. And we're using Levine's test again for the equality of error variances. And what we're doing is we're looking to see if this significance value is less than 0.05. If it is less than 0.05, then we do not have equal variances, equal variance among the groups. If it's greater than 0.05, then we do have equal variance and we've met that assumption. And so you can see here we have a significance level of 0.077, so we've met the assumption of equal variances across the subject groups. Okay, the next step is to determine whether or not we have statistical, statistical significance among our factors and among our groups. So this is that first step in the two-step process of ANOVA. <clears throat> so we can first look at exercise level and look at its F-score and p-value. So this p-value is greater than 0.05, so we would say that exercise level by itself had no significant effect on weight loss percentage or the, ef the effect was unclear in this group of subjects. So we can accept that first null hypothesis relative to exercise level. Next we can look at diet plan. And again we can look at the F score associated with that particular factor. And here's the p-value. That is definitely less than 0 0.05, 0 0.02. So we would be able to reject the null hypothesis saying that diet plan does have an effect by itself on weight loss percentage. And so for that particular factor, we will then be able to do post hoc testing to determine 
which diet plan was different from any of the others. And then lastly, we can look at the interaction between exercise level and diet plan to see if there was an effect there, and we can see there was not. So there was no unique combination of exercise level and diet plan that created significant change among our subject groups. Okay, so our next step, and so we would then accept that null hypothesis as well relative to the interaction, and we would also accept the null, or reject the null hypothesis relative to diet plan. So now we can move to the post hoc for our diet plan significance, the factor that is significant. So as we page down here, again, you can see reported the uh, means for just exercise level by itself. We can see the means reported for diet plan by itself. And then we can see the means reported for those interactions of exercise level and diet plan. <clears throat> so let's determine here which diet plans were different from each other. Okay, so first we'll look at the low fat plan versus the low carb plan. Were those two groups significantly different from each other on weight loss percentage? And we can see the significance is greater than 0.05. So those two groups were not different. We can look at the low fat plan versus the diet plan. Okay, and this value is greater than 0.05. So those two groups were not significantly different. Lastly, we can look at the low carb plan relative to the balanced plan. And we can see that that significance level is less than 0.05. Okay, so that pairwise comparison is statistically significant. So we had overall significance for a diet plan, but the only two groups that created that significant difference were the differences in the low carb plan versus the balanced plan. And if we page back up here, we can go back to the means and look at the means of the groups on the low fat plan, the low carb plan, and the balanced plan. And so we can see the low carb plan and the balanced plan were the only significant differences. And so we can see the low carb plan averaged 15% weight loss and the balanced plan averaged uh, about 6% weight loss. Okay, so the conclusions we can make then, um, and then we'll talk about clinical significance here shortly, but the conclusions we can make at this point is that uh, there is no effect or appears to be no effect or an unclear effect of exercise level by itself on weight loss. There appears to be an unclear effect of any interaction between exercise level and diet plan. There is a significant effect of diet plan on weight loss. The low carb plan appears to be the most effective as far as the percentage of weight loss, but the only plan it is significantly different than is the balanced plan. So again, if you had to choose between the low fat plan and the balanced plan, it doesn't really seem to make any difference. Um, if you were to choose between the low carb plan and the low fat plan, statistically speaking, it doesn't make a significant difference. Um, and if you were to choose between, again, the low carb plan and the balanced plan, the low carb plan appears to be the most effective. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the, cl the clinical significance of these results. And so we move back up to this large between subjects effects table. And so again, we look at diet plan and we follow across here and here's our significance level again. So we have statistical significance and we can look at the effect size. The eta squared is the effect size and a, an effect size of 0.277 is considered to be a small effect size. So even though we have significance statistically, the effect size isn't very, very large, so it may not be very meaningful. We can also look at the power. We're, we're close to that cutoff of 0.80, so this is slightly underpowered. Um, and so, again, this can call into question a little bit the, the accuracy of the results. So this is most likely due, again, to relatively small sample sizes. We had a couple groups that only had eight subjects in them. So that could have an effect on, on that particular outcome. Now the last thing we can look at are the confidence intervals, the 95% confidence intervals. 
And again, we saw a, a the only significant difference we saw was between the low carb plan and the balanced plan. So again, in this sample or in these samples, 15% versus 6%, that is a statistically a significant difference and, and it appears to likely be a clinically significant difference. But what we want to make sure is that there is uh, no overlap between the 95% confidence intervals between these two groups because again, if there is overlap, that could indicate that uh, in another sample or other samples, we could see results that would not be um, as, as strong um, or might not even be statistically significant. So if we look at the upper range of the balance plan, we can see that there are a number of samples that could actually have an 11% weight loss on the balance plan. And then we look at the lower level or the lower boundary of the low carb plan, and we can see that there are subjects that would be on that plan that could have a weight loss of only 10%. Uh, so we have an overlap here. So there could be a situation in which samples uh, that are on the balance plan and samples that are on the low carb plan that could actually have very similar outcomes. And having a, an 11% versus a 10%, that would not be statistically significant in most cases. Okay, so that, again, weakens the, the practical significance of this particular outcome. So as far as the practical significance is concerned, we have a small effect size. We're, we're slightly underpowered on the, the, the uh, strength of the analysis, and we also have some 95% confidence interval overlap. So even though we have statistical significance, I would say that the practical significance of this outcome is actually quite low. Because again, we could have other samples go through the same treatment or same treatments and have very different results. And what makes this even weaker is the fact that if we look at the low fat plan now, the upper boundary of their weight loss actually overlaps with both other plans. So that, that makes me think that this probably isn't a very accurate picture of what the true effect is for the diet plan. So even though we have statistical significance, I would say the practical significance is still unclear and we probably need to do some additional study. So to summarize then, with the factorial NOVA, we are, are looking at uh, three or more groups of subjects and these groups are being tested on at least two separate factors or at least two separate types of treatments. And so what we're looking for is to see the effect of one of the factors independently, the effect of another factor independently, and then the effect that an interaction of these two factors might have on the subjects. We then determine overall statistical significance with the ANOVA test. We then look at, if we have statistical significance, we would then look at post hoc tests to determine um, if there is pairs of groups that are truly significant from compared to one another. And then we look at the practical significance using the effect size, using the power, uh, using the 95% confidence intervals.